All right, what's up, y'all? So I'm going to do a brief intro to this interview, even though in the interview we have <laughs> some brief little intros. But I want to emphasize how important this information is. If you or anyone that you know suffers from sadness, anxiety, depression, or grief, which is all of us, many times throughout our lives, then you got to watch this video because your life may literally depend on it. Just like the health medical system, the psychiatric medical system is geared towards diagnosing and treating conditions. And a lot of times that involves prescribing drugs. Drugs such as antipsychotics, antidepressants, sleep aids, and drugs to counter the side effects of the drugs that you've already been prescribed. And before you know it, you could be on a fistful of drugs and not even know why. And we're not saying not to seek professional help. We're not saying not to take prescription drugs. We're saying that you need to be an educated consumer because the reality is that the psychiatric medical system, just like the health medical system, has to make money. And that money comes from diagnosing, treating, and prescribing drugs. And so if you or your loved ones are considering treatment or in treatment, you gotta watch this video because Angie pours her heart out with an intention to help and heal and give you the tools necessary to deal with the difficult situations. And I think every person in this modern world needs to watch this video. I'm gonna quote Angie here, everything that you need to deal with whatever it is that you're going through is already in you and it starts with you. I hope you guys enjoy this interview. Looks like a bunch of chaos going on over there. Just, just like upside down. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. I'm dr I'm just pulling into this parking lot right here, but I was like, let me just join so he doesn't freak out. I see us. There we are. We're at, we're live. All right. All sure. right, are you ready, girl? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. So since we have some people in here that might not know me, because I, I know that Angie has some people on her end that are kind of chiming in, allow myself to introduce myself. Remember that from uh, Awesome Powers? So uh, my name is Paul C. P. Harina, and I am a functional nutritional therapist and master health coach. I've been coaching 10 years. I absolutely love my life, helping people get healthy, teach them how to eat real food and sleep and meditate and work out, um, animal-based nutrition, ancestral-based health, simplified living. Um, and so that's me. I'm going to go ahead and introduce Angie, which I'm so excited to have her on here because she is just freaking great. Like I, you know, from the first time that we chatted, I felt a really, really great connection. Um, I feel like, you know, we've all been through a lot of difficult, challenging situations in our life, right? Um, you can tell when you interact with her, she's done the work and there's just something about her that exudes some kind of a wisdom. And, uh, you know, we've only chatted, I don't know, four or five times or something like that. And I feel like we're friends already. And, um, and I'm just really excited to have her and share her story. She's going to share her story. So I'm not going to go through her entire bio, but just to summarize it, let me know if I get this wrong, Angie. Um, Angie, Angie's ex-military, she was deployed to Iraq, and um, in that process, she experienced some very traumatic situations. And because of those situations, she ended up uh, seeking some professional help. And then she went down the mainstream uh, psychiatric kind of medical system route, including like diagnoses and treatments, which included some medications. And so uh, she has this, I would consider it like an epic heroic journey of um, discovering herself, navigating that system, pulling herself out of that system, healing herself, coming off of drugs and medications. And now she is living a life um, doing this, helping others. She's been featured in uh, a documentary called Medicating Normal. If you haven't seen it, it's freaking amazing. I thought it was so, so great. A lot of you know, what you learn through this is it mirrors the medical health system that a lot of us are kind of familiar with, or at least familiar with the, the downfalls and fallbacks of. Um, so I uh, highly recommend watching that. Uh, it was a documentary where they followed five different people going through similar experiences, traumatic experiences, coming off of medications and things like that. She's been featured on CBS, Nightly News, MSNBC, NPR, BBC. Hey, you got to get me in contact with your contacts at those places. I need to be featured on those things. That's amazing. Um, and then she's also inspiring to me. She is living a van life, traveling the nation, doing her thing. And um, I hope to join her at some point here in the near future. So is that okay? Did I get anything wrong there, Angie? Nailed it. Perfect. <laughs> All right. That's the first time anybody ever said I nailed it. Okay, cool. So Angie, let's start with uh, what's your story? Like, can you just give us some, now I know that you've got like a five hour version, an hour version, a three minute version. You can, I want you to take as much time as you want, because I feel like your story in and of itself is, um, has got a lot of great teachings in it. So yeah, feel free to just don't limit yourself there, but would you mind just kind of telling us how you got to where you are, what you're doing, all that kind of stuff. 
All right, I'll shoot for the five minute version. <laughs> or 10 or 15, I think that's totally cool. Okay, five to 15. Okay, we'll see how it goes. All right, so as you heard, I was in the military. L let me back up a little. I would say I didn't have the greatest childhood. I was raised by a single parent, my dad. And in the eighties, that was kind of unheard of. Um, I was the oldest of four. So I was, I grew up pretty fast, like taking care of brothers and sisters and stuff like that. Um, but I was an athlete. I always played soccer and, you know, sports. I, I always was had an adventurous spirit. I was always like outgoing and joining all the clubs and all the things, you know? So the military was a natural fit because I thought like, this whole like s small city living, um, going to college and like waitressing at the airport holiday Inn was not working for me. <laughs> I was like, I got to do something meaningful and something big and something epic. I've always just been like that. So I joined the military at 18, took off. Um, I, I excelled at my job. I was like one of the top soldiers always. I was always like winning boards, getting promoted ahead of guys, running faster what, than guys. I, what was your job? I forget, Was it oh, intelligence or what? No, I was, um, uh, what's it called Com like basically communications electronics mm. so we set up all the big antennas the phone company basically the phone company for the army something like that yeah so um on 9 11 uh, i was in washington dc i knew we were going to war i was ready for it i trained for that i wasn't afraid at all um and it was just a matter of time i was in germany at the time we got deployed to baghdad iraq at the very beginning of the war so if you remember on cnn that long convoy of vehicles heading toward baghdad i was yeah. right that so uh, back then, women are not in combat, <laughs> but I'm telling you, I was right there getting combat pay with all the guys. Um, I think my family thought I was sitting behind a desk somewhere playing on a computer. That was not the case. Um, we basically, we set up the, the whole communication system for Baghdad so that all the commanders could, could talk to each other. And we did that in about three days. And then the rest of the time I was there, we ran convoys, getting shot at, uh, very dangerous situations very scary situations, doing things that I'm like, when I look back now, I'm like, I'm so lucky that I'm not dead just from that, just crazy stuff, driving through the center of, you know, a big gathering of males that are doing who knows what. Um, anyway, it was very like scary. rioting kind of stuff, right? <clears throat> yeah. Like, just like, you should know better than to drive through the center of a huge gathering of men. Like that's not smart. You know what I mean? Uh, driving through markets in another country, <laughs> in another country, yeah. running into vehicles, you know, dodging roadkill because there's bombs in it. Children carrying bombs that are trying to sell you things like every corner hmm. is like uh, something dangerous. And so I think looking back on post-traumatic stress, and maybe we'll touch on this later, but I obviously had like my, my nervous system rewired itself toward danger and toward like threat detection. However, I don't look at that as a disease. It's more of like a learning, like I'm had to learn all these things to keep myself alive. So in Iraq, that is completely, you need that. But then the second you jump on an airplane, you fly back to the United States. Now you have a brain disease. Doesn't make any sense, but anyway, there it is. So, um, well, so hold on a second, but, and we're going to get into this too, but you, when you say that you're looking back saying that was your, you had to adapt, right? Had to. And and then coming back, you know, you had a readaptation or something like that. But but then I guess the medical system made you feel like that there was something wrong with you or something, right? You know, and that happens yeah. not just in war. That happens when you said brain disease, you were you were kind of almost being sarcastic, right? Like saying brain that's, disease. That's okay, how it's treated. Yep. You know, here's your drugs. But uh, so, you know, the same thing goes for people with you know domestic violence, childhood abuse, rape. I mean, you learn to keep yourself safe. That's an adaptation of your nervous system that you evolved to do. But anyway, mm -hmm. so we'll come back to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> However, sorry. Uh, okay, so, so I, I also developed some kind of gastrointestinal illness while I was in Iraq. And within one month, I went from 140 pounds of muscle to hundred pounds of skin and bone. And you could yeah, see, I wish we could pull a picture up. Like it was crazy. I wish I could, I wish I could show yeah. you, but it was like, literally you could see my cheekbones. My face was sucking in. I would stare at the, my ribs. I never saw myself so emaciated and uh, there was no medical treatment for me. There, the the best they could do is like poop in a cup and check for parasites. That was not the problem. So there was no treatment for it. So I just kept going back to the, like the medical supervisor or whatever you want to call him. And he would check my temperature and my blood pressure and we would just write it down. And so I was having low grade fevers. I was having like high heart rate. I was passing out. I had bloody noses, like all kinds of stuff that didn't make any sense. So now I'm like running convoys and sick at the same time and nobody cares. And I'm like, I'm going to freaking die. That's just what's going to happen. Okay. Did you ever figure and, that out? I don't think I ever. Yeah, I think it was the anti malaria pills, doxycycline. Oh, shit. Yeah. Microbiome. Hmm. Okay. And I started to experience anxiety. 
and then panic attacks. And then I'm like, I'm going to die. Like in this war zone, I'm never going to see my family again. Hmm. So after six months of living like that and running convoys three to four times a week and pulling guard duty, 12 hour shifts, I finally, we got a new commander and she's like, you are going to die. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I, I'm pretty sure of that. So she, she put in the paperwork. I was medically evacuated out of Iraq for a non-combat illness and taken back to Germany. And wouldn't you know it, the day I get to Germany, I see one of our first sergeants, like it's a leadership position back from Germany. I'm like, what are you doing at the hospital? And he's like, oh, your convoy got hit. This is the day after I get home. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Uh, who is injured? And so it was one of my soldiers who I'd stand up, I'd stood up for who I loved like a, like a brother, you know, and I was devastated. And so I see him and he's got like wires coming out and he's in a coma, medically induced coma. And they said, he's going to go through surgery. When he comes out in the recovery room, you can come talk to him. So I go talk to him the next day. I don't even, I don't ever usually talk about this part of the story, but anyway, he shared what happened with me in very visceral detail. And I see his colostomy bag and his staples and the whole thing. And I was like, I can't take one more traumatic thing. Like, that was the second my cup was over. I could not handle one more thing. So I was like, I quieted him down. I was like, okay, I'm really sorry this happened. Stay here, heal. I got to go. And I walked down the hallway and there was a sign that said psychiatry with an arrow. And I was like, that's where you go when you are overwhelmed. Right. So I go in the office and I'm like, sir, I can't, I can't adapt to Germany. This traumatic thing just happened and a whole bunch happened. And I just can't, I can't, I can't sleep. I, I don't know what to do. I was just freaking out in that moment, you know? So he gave me a prescription for a benzodiazepine. That's an anti-anxiety drug. And it was called clonopin or clonizepam is the uh, generic version. So I took it just, okay, this is supposed to help me. I go back to the barracks, whatever. I started taking that drug. I started getting worse pretty quickly. However, I was told this is your post-traumatic stress forming. Yeah. This is not even a consideration. It's the medication. It's like your, your illness is uh, progressing or something like that. Yes. Yeah. So, so I started getting worse, but again, I didn't even know. I couldn't tell. I just got back to Germany two days ago and now I can hardly sleep. I can't really go outside. Every, everybody's calm. And I'm like, this is so weird. Like everybody should be worried that a bomb is going to come in. You know what I mean? Like I just wasn't there. I wasn't, you literally are on an airplane in a combat zone and then you're in Germany drinking a beer with your friends. It's a very stark transition. People stop shooting at you. It's overnight. It's like, what the heck is going on? Okay. So Basically, the next eight months, I'm still in the military. I'm getting ready to be redeployed back to Iraq. And then it just get worse and worse and worse. And then I'm still going to the doctor. I'm telling them something's wrong. I don't feel good. I can't sleep. I'm full of anxiety. Every time somebody slams a door, I think it's a gunshot going off. Um, I feel like the ceiling is caving in on me. Every time an airplane goes over, I'm terrified. Like, I don't know what that is. I, we didn't talk about post-traumatic stress in 2003. I had no idea what that is. So I'm just telling the doctor all this stuff. So they are putting me on more medication. Here's an antidepressant. Here's Ambien for sleep. Here's something for your heart rate. You know, nobody looked at my gut microbiome. Nobody asked me, do you just need a hug? Do you need Or ask you about your nutrition or your sleep or your Nothing. anything, right? Do you need, do you need so, a week to recompose? Yeah. As you were getting prescribed those things, did you have anything, like, were you fully trusting the system or did you have anything inside you that was like, oh, maybe this isn't a good idea? Like. No. And I think it's because my dad had a bipolar diagnosis growing up. So he went to the psychiatrist. So I thought mm. that's what you're supposed to do. However, yeah. I always doubted my dad's treatment. Cause I was like, he's not any better. He's, he's, I hate to say this, but I was like, dad, you go to the therapist, but you're still an asshole. Like, I don't understand. It's not working. You know what I mean? <laughs> like it didn't make sense to me for him, but it, for me, I was like, that's what you're supposed to do. I don't know. So anyway, I was medically retired from the U S army with full benefits at 24 years old and told I was permanently disabled. Hmm. So I went from top soldier, like literally runner up. I was going to um, say, how did that feel? First armored division, non-commissioned hmm. officer of the year to piece of shit in one day, literally. Hmm. And I felt very thrown away. I remember the next day I woke up and I was staring at the ceiling. Like, what am I supposed to do? This is the first day in seven years. I didn't wake up and put a uniform on. Like, who am I? I don't know. So I just totally lost my identity. I'm told I'm ill. I'm doing all this treatment. Um, I just, 
I, you don't even know, you know what I mean? It's like, you don't even, you can't even catch up to like what just happened. Yeah. <laughs> so like the- basically the next 13 years, I did all the treatment. I was on full disability. Um, I had agoraphobia where I didn't leave my house. There was one point I was on 18 medications at the same time, completely out of my mind. And mm. that takes away the ability to even know that there's something wrong with that. I'm listening to all my doctors. Um, my entire life for the next 13 years revolved around therapy appointments retreats for veterans for trauma you know horse therapy service dog um emdr eft you know cbt cpt uh psychiatry once a month sitting in walgreens drive-thrus picking up prescriptions um filling out questionnaires about my symptoms like my entire life was being a patient Hmm. and Um, and looking back on that you know now you realize now that a big part of that was the medications and it was, it wasn't yeah, even yeah. the actual yeah, stress. Or something. For it. It's kind of a little risque called, um, what is it called? Medication spellbinding. Like you're so medicated, you don't even know what's going on hmm. and you think you're doing well. That's the scary part. Like I thought I need these meds. They're helping me. I will kill myself without them. I need them to function, et cetera, et cetera. So I was lucky in 2010, I met a psychiatrist who said, I'm a psychiatrist who doesn't believe in psychiatry. And he said, who put you on all these drugs? You got it. We got to get you off. So he took me off 10 overnight, which was hallucinating in the hospital. It was terrifying. Um, But I got off like 10 of them pretty quickly, probably not the right way. I would not recommend it. But then I spent the next like eight years or 10 years, like slowly getting off of everything else. And it was a very slow process. I did not consciously think, I'm going to get off all the meds and I'm going to heal myself. That was not even in the realm of possibility, not even a thought in my head. I just was looking at it like, why am I taking all these meds and I don't feel good? I feel horrible. Why don't I have friends? Why don't I, I'm in my thirties. Why do I don't have a sex drive? Why am I not like dating? Like those were the thoughts I was having. Why don't I care about watching TV? I don't, it was, but it was very, you know, like maybe one every six months I would get a thought like that. Hmm. So It was just a little small intuition, like just take less. How can you take less? So that doctor helped me take less. Thank God. However, it was kind of a cycle. Like I would take, I would take one less drug, but then he would put me on something else. And then I would be back on to help you taper off. Did he know what he was doing? Like like I would come off some Balta and I had really bad anxiety. So then he put me on and back on benzos. Mm. So it was like, Mm. it was like take two steps forward and one step back because they keep medicating the symptoms instead of like recognizing perhaps these drugs are harming you and you're having withdrawal effects and we need to just give it time and let your body rebalance. Not sounds sounds like this guy was in a better direction, but still slightly contributing to the problem. Yeah. Yeah. So then uh, I get down to, I have two drugs left. You know, I remember I started on like 18. (laughs) I'm down to two both anti-anxiety drugs. And, um, basically this doctor said, okay, pick one. You shouldn't be on both. So I come down to one and then I start tapering that one. And again, I'm not thinking I'm going to get all the way off of this. I'm just like, I just want to take less, see what happens. You know, I just curiosity. So I get down and all of a sudden I start developing severe symptoms. Like I'm talking severe suicidal thoughts, urges to do it. I never experienced anything like that before. Um, intrusive thoughts, like scary. I was a little bit paranoia, like severe depression. And all the while I'm like, I am in college. I am a statistics tutor. I have everything going for me. I'm one semester away from graduating with my bachelor's degree with like a 3.75 GPA, nine, I'm sorry, 3.94 GPA. Why am I suicidal? This does not make any sense. I have no reason to die. Okay. If anything, I have everything going for me. I'm so proud of myself. I was doing CrossFit five times a week. I was competing in CrossFit, like at a novice level, you know, the easy version. I was running one 5k a month. I did tough mutter. I did a 10 mile mud race. I loved doing that kind of stuff. I was doing like cave races, like all kinds of weird, cool things. I'm like, why am I suicidal? This does not make any sense. I think it's remarkable that in in the context of all that going on, that you still had some kind of an an intuition, you know, that you would have these reflective moments, even though they were kind of spaced out, you know? Yeah. But so the doctor did not recognize you're in withdrawal because you've gotten down to a low dose of the drug and your body is like, what is going on here? Mm. So he, he tried to diagnose me with agitated depression and now you need to take lithium. And I was like, no, I'm not taking this shit anymore. No, I've done this for you guys. I'm sorry to get upset here, but I've taken your shit for 13 years and I am worse than I've ever been. 
And I had a client say this recently. I have to repeat it on your watch. Look what's happened to me Hmm. on your watch. Look at how bad my life feels right now. It was probably my lowest point in my entire life in that moment. And I was like, nope, you're not putting me on nothing. I'm coming off of this shit. I don't care what's going to happen. So, um, so by that point, you, you, you kind of knew, had an idea that was the medications that were contributing. I was so disillusioned. Like when you go in an office Mm. and they ask you all your symptoms and then they give you a new diagnosis. I was like, what is that going to do for me? Mm. Just I'm collecting diagnoses and collecting drugs. And you give me this list of drugs that I feel no better. And I just was so, I'm just like, I was just so angry. It's like, you're full of shit. Like, that's how. I could just, I was just done. I just, I don't know what else to say. I was done. I was just done. So long story short, I checked myself into the hospital because I was extremely suicidal. I really thought I like, I can't not even one more second. And when I'm putting those last three pills in my mouth, the last three pills I ever took that, that third pill, I was like, I can't take this. Like, this feels like poison. I'm like poisoning myself. I can't do this one more day. I can't. So I checked myself in. They, they cold turkeyed me off of this very highly physiologically dependent, addictive drug. And six days later, my entire nervous system blew up. And I don't, this is hard for me to talk about because a lot of people don't have the frame of reference to understand the amount of suffering that I entered. But my body, every cell went insane. Like every, it did not understand. You went from taking this drug for, you know, these drugs for 13 years and you're off nothing overnight. This is why you don't cold turkey. People die from this. Okay. People in jail get cold turkey off their drugs and they die in prison. That is what happens. Okay. So I did everything except die. <laughs> like every cell of my body went insane. I had burning skin, severe suicidal and homicidal thoughts. I had um, severe depression. I couldn't stand up to shower for two and a half years. I lost the ability to read. I went mute for four months. I couldn't read. I couldn't look at faces. I couldn't look at Facebook. I couldn't look at screens. Like my entire nervous system exploded. And I knew if I tell a psychiatrist what is going on, they will put me back on drugs and I will get more diagnoses. And I'm not going to do that. That sucks. I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to die or if I'm going to heal from this. But I'm not going to hurt myself and I'm not going to take another drug and I'm just going to hold on to hope and see what happens. I had enough of hmm. with, with me to do that. Just this little ounce. <laughs> That's crazy, though, to not feel like you can be honest about what you're going through because you're you're worried about, like, you know, how they're going to um, and, and treat and it and diagnose it. And, uh, right. And I knew enough that I was normal and now I'm not. And the only thing that happened yeah. between then and now is you were cold turkey me off of this drug. So it was very clear to me that this drug did this. Okay. So for some, it's not clear. Like, you're like, am I crazy? Do I need drugs? Like I, Mm. I feel really mentally ill now. Maybe I need them. I don't know. But I was lucky on that day six, I found an online community of people that were tapering drugs. It was a hundred thousand patients tapering drugs and feeling withdrawal from normal psychiatric drugs. I did not know such a thing existed. I have a degree in psychology. I went to AA meetings. I went to therapy. Mm. Nobody ever told me drugs cause withdrawal. Nobody. I never knew that. Doesn't seem like the physicians know much of that either, because I remember watching that documentary, like the physicians that were interviewed, they're like, it can't be, you're not having withdrawals. This is your condition. Right. And it, it yeah. looks just like a condition. It sure does. It looks like schizophrenia in my case, you know? Yeah. Um. Anyway. So then I began the healing journey and I was like, I can't take drugs. Like it's not going to, I can't, I tried, I was on 43 psychiatric drugs in a 13 year period. I have tried mm-hmm. them all, every single one of them except well, maybe a few, but, uh, so I gave my body time. I hung on to my healing buddies, people that were going through the same thing as me. I only talked to them about what was going on with me. I knew better. Don't tell anybody. Cause they're going to call 911. You're done. Go to the hospital. So I just weathered it. I fixed all my diet, my nutrition. I went like paleo ancestral. Um, I'm not a big meat eater. I tried so hard to just eat carnivore animal based, but I just couldn't do it. I couldn't do big hunks of steak and stuff. Uh, we'll get you there. I know. I know. Then uh, I did everything I could to regulate sleep. I mean, it like literally my life depended on all the stuff I should have learned before taking the first drug, Mm. meditation, breathing exercises, exercise, talking to friends, crying, feeling my feelings, like all of that. It was incredibly hard, you guys. And I did not even feel like a human being for four years, four years of suffering. And if I knew it was going to take me that long to even just feel like a little bit normal, I probably would have killed myself. You know what I mean? But I just stayed in the present moment. I can't think about tomorrow. I can't think about next week. What can I do for the next five minutes to not Mm -hmm. 
to just get through the next five minutes. So my life like literally existed in like one minute to five minute increments for a few years. Uh, okay. So fast forward. I, once I started feeling normal, I went back to school. I got a master's in social work. I felt like a double agent. Cause I was like, let me learn about this mental health system so that I can fight back because this is terrible. What happened to me? And I was like, I'm going to learn their language and I'm going to get their letters and then I'm going to tear it down. <laughs> that sounds you know? exciting. Yeah, it's kind of fun. So I graduated with a master's of social work from Washington University in St. Louis. Um, I did a lot of policy stuff. So I flew to D.C. and talked about this issue. Um, I was in the film. The film followed me. So after I graduated, three things happened. My lease was up. I felt like a human being <laughs> again. And the film was coming out. And fourth thing, all my friends were getting really shitty social work jobs. And I was like, I don't want to do that. So I took I went and bought an RV. And I started traveling with the film and I started screening the film in cities. Uh, and, and then the pandemic happened and kind of ruined everything. But so I, in an accumulation, I have done 180 film screenings with panels afterwards discussing all of these issues. And we have experts and academics and researchers that know about withdrawal and know about the evidence mm. base of medicine mm. for mental health. Uh, therapists that work from a different lens instead of pathologizing you, like seeing how your trauma could have impacted you or dietitians like Georgia Ede. She's been a panelist for us. Um, Bessel van der Kolk from the trauma world. I sat next to him on a panel and I was like, oh my God, this is awesome. Just like all these people that think about this differently, then there's something wrong with you. Take a pill and go home and be quiet. Like there's more to it than that. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I just, I've been doing that. I did that for three years, uh, just, you know, with the film. And then I basically quit everything. And I just started seeing people individually coaching, like consulting about like, if you're on five drugs, how do you get off of that? Um, I'm not a doctor. I don't give medical advice directly. I just help them go through the decisions, look at all the dis different decision points, what we do know about withdrawing from psychiatric drugs, harm reduction, and then like how to get your health back when you're healing from that. Um, how to just cope because ment your mental health issues do not go away. I still have my tra trauma. It's still in my body a little bit, you know, and then like, how do you live a good life and how do you build a good life? I think I've done that successfully. I definitely have gotten pulled myself away. I've rebuilt my entire nervous system from the ground up. Like it was like an atom bomb dropped on my life, you know? Yeah. And so I just <clears throat> help individuals now one-on-one -on -one, and I do stuff like this and I just love talking about it. Like I could talk about this stuff all day. So that that's my story. Did how, how much? That was 30 minutes. Oh no, my God. it was like, it was like, the, uh, like 18. So how long have you been doing the coaching? So I've been coaching for one year, individual, like full-time professionally, but mm -hmm. this whole seven years that I was going through it, I was helping people the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. One year officially. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's, I mean, it's remarkable. Right. And, and um, I just want to highlight that you had these moments throughout that entire process where you were paying attention to your intuition, even though you kind of numbed out and drugged out. And so you had this hint of like this real version of yourself in there that was trying to get out or something like that. Right. And then you started to, to slowly, but surely honor that more and more until you got to the point to where you just said, okay, I got to do something different. I got to get out of this, you know? Um, so I'm hearing something in there. It, this reminds me so much of like the mainstream kind of medical health system, you know? So um, maybe, can you just elaborate on like, what is, define like mental illness or emotional illness. And then can you speak to, I remember hearing something in the documentary about how, I don't know when it was, maybe like around the 1980s when the psychiatric medical system had this ability to um, group symptoms together and then call that a diagnosis. And that led to the ability to treat and prescribe drugs or something like that. Yeah. So it depends what, whose definition you go by, but I would say like mainstream narrative is if you can't function or you have symptoms that impact your daily life, then you would fall into, you have a, a legitimate diagnosis. So here's some things we don't, the mainstream. Sounds like a heartbreak. Anything. <laughs> the death of a loved one. I, my dog died last year. I couldn't function. Mm. You know, technically yeah. I would have a major depression from that. You know, yeah. basically yeah. anybody could have any diagnosis, but let me try to say it straight. So Yes. Back in the eighties, the American psychiatric association was trying to differentiate themselves as like uh, their own separate field of medicine. And so they kind of took realm of the mind, you know, and behavior. Um, a way to do that was to, to group symptoms together and come up with discrete diagnoses. However, if you grab any DSM, I don't have to tell you, you can go see it for yourself. There is no citations in the back of the DSM. It's 
clinical observance. It's doctors voting on, we see this cluster of symptoms. It's an easy way to categorize people. It's a way to bill insurance. That's right. It. When you And when you're saying there's no citations, there's not been controlled studies. It's like a group of people got together and said, hey, we're going to agree that if this person has this symptom and this symptom and this symptom, we're going to call it this. Yes. And then these and are it, the medications that we can prescribe and the treatment. Yeah. Protocols. And it's very arbitrary. So for example, there's something called the grief exclusion between DSM-5 and DS, I think DSM-4 and 5, where they would say like grief, if you feel grief for a loved one that you lost for six months, that would be normal. But on six months and one day, now you have major depression. They hmm. changed that in DSM-4, I'm sorry, five to two weeks. You're only allowed to grieve a loved one for two weeks. And then on two weeks and one day, you have major depression. And when you, I actually researched that because I was like, I don't understand where, where did that even come from? They were trying to, their argument is that grief situation triggered an underlying major depression okay prove that to me prove it you can't that's it's just like it doesn't even make sense and then the other interesting thing about diagnosis is you'll say how do you know i have bipolar oh it's because you have the symptoms okay but then why do i have the symptoms oh it's because you're bipolar it's a circular argument there's no testing there's no test to do it it's i could i could you could ask me questions and i could tell you the answers and between five practitioners, we would all come up with something different. Yeah. There's nothing scientific about it, okay? But the public, me too, I, that was my identity. I have post-traumatic stress. To me, it was like right. a bad honor that I survived something hard and then I got compensated for that. You know yeah. what I mean? That I had meaning, it meant something, it explained how I felt. Oh my God, it makes sense, you know? Yeah. And so we have really grasped onto that diagnosis as identity. Um, to make meaning out of like what we're suffering. And I, I get that part. However, mm -hmm. like psychiatry has not been honest with us to say like, no, this is just a way for us to like point to what we're all talking about as the same thing and to bill insurance. That's it. Yeah. There's nothing scientific about it. I was going to say like, you have the ability now, you know, after what you've been through to look at that and say, wait, this doesn't make any sense. But for anyone listening or watching, like most of us wouldn't know that, right. You go in and, and you're trusting a medical professional and you've got, you know, these symptoms and you answer a questionnaire and, and they're like, oh, you got this. And, and it does, it, it probably feels a little bit, um, I don't know, like a um, confirming or, or acknowledging validating. or something like that to, to say, yeah, validating. There you go. Um, to have that. But, but, but yeah. then, but then the risk there is that now you've been given this label and, and there's, you just, you got to be careful because of what comes after that, right. The, the yes. types of treatments offered. And things. Yeah. So basically if you have post-traumatic stress or major depression or anxiety, here is the drugs we give for that. And here's the treatments we give for that. It's yeah. not very individualized. Nobody asks you what happened in your life just before you started feeling these symptoms or have we tested you for, you know, B12 deficiency or D or what is your family life like, or what is your friends? Do you have human connection in your life? Nobody asks any of these questions. It and is there's probably and there's probably no coordination with your primary care physician and your other medications and other health issues that you have going on. And and generally, GPs, family doctors prescribe seventy to eighty percent of psychiatric drugs without any psychiatric training. And in general, you get eight minutes with each one of those doctors. So they don't they don't have time to ask you why are you depressed? Is there any reasons in your life that you might be feeling depressed? Have you had a recent bout of antibiotics that killed your microbiome that could be impacting your mood or your sleep? Did anything happen stress related? No, they don't have time. You say, I don't feel good. You screen positive on a questionnaire. You get a Prozac. Yeah. That's it. So this, so psychiatry before this was, was more what we would think of as therapy then, right? It was more psychoanalytic. They right. put you in a chair and they did therapy with you for an hour and a half, but we, we didn't have time for that. Now we need to see lots of patients and make some money. And we don't, you know, and we want to be a medical profession. So leave that therapy stuff to the therapist and we'll take over the medical side. But again, yeah. even when you see her, like, even when I saw psychiatry for 13 years, it was, what are your symptoms? Okay. Let's throw a drug at it to treat your symptoms. There was nothing else other than that. And that there was, was no, like your symptoms could possibly be from a medication ever. Uh, even yeah, if you had, never. you said what, 13 or 18 meds or something at one 18, point? 18 at the same time. Never be was like, it. Be like the first thing most people would say, like, oh, you're taking all these things. Maybe it could be linked to something that you're taking here. And that's something I talk about with my clients all the time is like your body's natural state is wellness. If you're not feeling well, it's something in your environment or your eating or your friendships or your job, jo something in your environment is preventing you from being well. So when yeah. you're on 18 medications, the question shouldn't be, let's add 19. No, take away some of that and see what happens. There's wellness underneath. 
I didn't know. I learned that the hard way, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I I think a big takeaway for anyone listening to this is that you just, you know, um, you have to be your own advocate. You have to educate yourself and understand that, Hey, when I go in here, I don't know, you just have to be careful. You know, it's not, it's not saying don't seek professional help. Don't seek advice. Don't, um, you know, try to work with or deal with whatever it is you're going through, but you just have to be really careful when it comes to the medical system, I guess. I don't know. Um, so I think this would be a good segue then into, um, like, uh, general, you know, what kind of general advice could we give any, anyone, everyone, because we all go through our own versions of traumatic experiences, right. And everything's relative to each person going through that. So whether you think you're like, you know, mentally ill or emotionally unstable or on meds or not on meds, like what advice would you give for everyone, all of us, yeah. you know, like what are your recommendations for coping with, um, mental and emotional stress? Or well, do you it's have- yeah, it's tricky because. I mean, people do take medications and they work for them. And so I'm Mm -hmm. not here to tell you your meds aren't working for you. I mean, I thought mine worked for me for years. Okay. So I'm not here to tell you that. I I just want consumers to to make more informed decisions. So number one, when you take, when you are prescribed a medication, I don't care what it's for, go on Google and put FDA pamphlet and the drug name and read the whole thing, read the whole thing. Because if I would have done that, it was all there. It was mm. all there. Side effects. All, everything. Was how long there. you should be taking it and stuff like that, right? Yep. How it's been studied, uh, any side effects. And, you know, I met a pharmacist, actually the pharmacist in the film for Medicating Normal. He said, keep a journal. The minute you start taking a drug, start writing a journal. What What are you feeling? Is there any change? You know, give yourself a rating system or something. You know, I today is a five. Yesterday was a three. Hmm. But before I started this, I was like at an eight. So what's going on here? You know what I mean? Uh, so ask questions of the pharmacist, go talk to the pharmacist. When a doctor puts you on a medication, ask them, what is the exit plan? I never had an exit plan. How long am I supposed to take this? Um, what should I look out for? I would tell you, most doctors don't know. They don't know how to take people. I was going to say, they, maybe they, they never have a pamphlet. Them. Ask your doctor, what do you know? I always tell this to clients. If you're on an antidepressant, always say, what do you know about antidepressant withdrawal? Don't tell them what you know. Don't tell them what you Googled. Ask them. What training have you had in taking people off antidepressants? Hmm. And, I would and that would be a good way to vet a, do- a doctor, right? Yeah. But yeah, so just make more informed decisions. So the other thing is skills. Like when I look back on what happened to me, I did not, first of all, nobody should be expected to withstand such a large amount of trauma where like you cannot cope with it. However, that's the world we live in. Okay. So I, I can't go back and say to myself, like if I would have just learned some coping, that would have fixed it. No, I don't, I don't believe that. I believe that trauma was so great. I could not withstand it. However, there was nobody in my life that was even capable of telling me like, this is going to be hard and you're not going to feel good and you're going to need some time to regenerate and you need to go, go home and stay with your family for a month and get low stress. Like we need to tell each other that, like, be honest about it. Like when your spouse dies, you're going to feel grief. Like your heart is going to break open and physically ill for months. That is normal. Yeah. If you felt yeah. anything different than that, I would be scared for you. You know what I mean? Yeah. When you have a job where there, there's people being racist towards you and you are paranoid going to work and full of anxiety, quit your job or something. You know, we don't, it's not, we, we blame, this is my biggest critique of the mental health system is it's the person's brain that's the problem. It ain't your brain. It's your context. It's the people in your life can't hold you when you're traumatized and scared and alone. It's we don't have systems to support that, like take some time off work. No, it's like go to the psych ward. That's your only option. Right. Right. And take some Prozac. That's like all we got, you know, for you. Yeah. So, yeah. I think I think a lot of and, and like we've talked about this already. I think what I'm hearing you say here is that, you know, these traumatic situations that we experience is part of the human condition. Right. Like we have life events that are and it's not to minimize them or to belittle them in any way or to say that they're not hard or challenging or traumatic but what we're saying here is that it's part of life it doesn't mean that you're not normal that's you know when i finally you help me understand what what the documentary title medicating normal meant you know what they're saying is that if you if you're outside of what is normal if you don't feel if you feel sad and depressed and upset and have anxiety then that's not normal you need to get yourself back to even keel and what you're saying is that this is life. This is life. And it's going to be hard. Right. And I mean, in a lot even, of ways, even and you have to say that 
Yeah. Even when you say it like that, I, I even bristle inside. Cause I know people are like, but you don't understand my life, you know, or no, like, I get it. I get it. I get I, it. Yeah. I yeah, totally yeah. get it. And I'm telling you, like, I have parents that come see me with kids with schizophrenia and psychosis and delusional, and they're running down the street with no clothes on. And I, I have to tell them, listen, we don't have answers. I don't know. Nobody knows. Yeah. I don't know yeah. what to say. Even, so, even that. Well, maybe a, a way to say this then is to consider the possibility that it doesn't have to just be this one route of like, there's something wrong with you and, and you need treatment. Like, it's like, this, this is life and we have to figure out how to deal with it. In addition to, if you need to seek professional help or something like that. Yeah. And it's, you know, and I wouldn't say like, I've done so much therapy. It's ridiculous, but I just think when, when they try to offer you an easy answer, this is what I know about it. It prevented my healing process from happening naturally. It kicked the can down the road because now I'm 13 years behind on my grieving process and I'm healing my stuff. And when I came off all the medication, guess what? My problems are still there. My trauma is still there. So to me, it didn't help me. It made life incredibly hard. It robbed me of like 20 years of my life. And I'm just now, I'm just now like seven years off medication, like feeling like full of life and like. I can enjoy things and things are okay. And my nervous system is like settled and like, okay, we're okay. Like years, but you, but you, but you still had to deal with and work through that traumatic experience of, of your, your soldier and, and, and your soldiers yeah. being you know, bombed and attacked and things like that. Yeah. And it doesn't end, you know, life still continues. Like I yeah. still feel anxiety. I still feel depression. It doesn't go away. It's not magic. Like I'm still a human being with, you know, on this planet. So yeah. you, you have to find new ways to cope with it, I guess, you know? Yeah. So, so I think a big takeaway is that the, these things that we experience, the stress, the anxiety, the sadness, you know, they're, they're a part of this human journey and not to minimize or belittle those things in any way and not to discourage you from seeking professional treatment or help in any way. But, um, you know, it's things that we just, we have to learn to work through in our own way, like whatever that is, using the support of other people and therapy. And sometimes you need the medical system to some degree, right? But it's just factoring in all these things that you know now that you didn't know in the beginning to help you make a more educated decision with it, right? Yeah. And it was, and, and it was it, really, last thing I think that's so important. We talked, me and you talked about this before, like mm-hmm. we are looking for experts or a program or a therapy or a treatment. And really it's the opposite of that. You have the answer. And once you are led back to yourself and you really get down and dirty with your symptoms and your past and your fears and all of it, like it's literally the way I, it's really scary. I don't even like to say it like this, but it's like me and my suffering in a room. And what am I going to do about it? Yeah. And like, you can chase that in all the different ways, you know, with drugs or alcohol or sex or medical system or Prozac, whatever. But like, at the end of the day, what I learned is like, I only have the answers and I got to figure out how to live this life with my set of circumstances, with my upbringing, with my genetics, what makes me feel good, what makes me feel bad, what food do I eat nourishes me. And and then my symptoms are talking to me all the time. Like Angie, yeah. you're a little anxious this morning and it's because you were rushing around and you drank too much caffeine. Maybe don't yeah. do that tomorrow. You know, and so every yeah, day is learning. Yeah. Every yeah, day. Yeah, I want to talk about I want to talk about the symptoms, but you know, you know the situation that I'm going through, right? And um, and if I hear you right, what you're saying is sometimes you. I, I remember talking to my sisters. I'm going through this, and I have nights where I'm just I'm I'm bawling, like my heart hurts, right? Yeah, yeah. And she's like, Paul, oh, I mean, you you have you need to let yourself feel that. You need to feel let it. yourself be with that, right? And and I made uh-huh. myself not numb out, not go to alcohol, and that would have been a the perfect time for it, right? Not sit there and watch movies. Like I would literally sit up in bed and lay in bed and just feel it, you know, and Let and, your heart I, break. and and just you know, and just experience what it is that we're going through. It doesn't make it easy. It doesn't make it painless or anything like that. It's just we're just saying there's a lot of things that you can use to support yourself going through these things. And part of that is you, you have to just be with whatever it is that you're going through and experience, allow yourself to feel grief, allow yourself to feel pain, allow yourself to cry you know, talk to your friends and family members about these things. Like it, it doesn't make it any easier, but it's just, it's, it is what it is, you know? Um, now what about, um, what would you, because I've heard you say a few things about like the nutrition and like how important is, are those things in dealing with situations or preventing, like what, what would you say about that? I mean, there's a lot moving in the mental health world surrounding nutrition like keto diet reducing bipolar symptoms and making people asymptomatic like it's amazing it's all over the place you I don't have to believe me go look but I came to it like I felt like my body was so 
physiologically disturbed that like there's some healing process going on and I'm trying to support it as best as I can. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect. Okay. But I'm like, I got to get as close to clean as I can get. And what I heard was there's a, there's a nutrition guy on YouTube. I listened when I was so sick, I was literally listening to YouTube after YouTube, trying to learn, like, how do I fix this? How do I heal myself? Oh my God, what do I do? And this guy said, every food you eat is fixing cells in your body. Like your body is fueled off everything you put in your body. So you better choose wisely. And that really stuck with me. Like, okay, am I going to fuel myself with McDonald's or am I going to fuel myself with like grass fed, pasture raised, you know, meat and uh, the freshest veg I can find. Like it was a no brainer to me. And I could feel it because my nervous system was so disturbed. I could feel everything coming in my body. I could feel it. I could feel this feels good. This feels bad. I could feel like the second it touched my lips, like "Mm -mm, this is not going to go well. You know, yeah. I could just feel it. So, I mean, I'm again, I'm not perfect, but it was so integral. And I remember at 11 months off, I went on this Kelly Brogan protocol, which is basically ancestral. I, I love Kelly Brogan. You know her? She's kind yeah, of gone yeah. off the left field lately, but with the COVID thing. But yeah, yeah. Uh, she, I did follow her protocol and it was, you only drink water, <laughs> like no caffeine, no decaf, no nothing. And it was like very clean food. Women, you could eat a little bit more carbs around your period. And I'm not kidding you. Like, I think 20 symptoms resolved overnight. Like I had this itching on my chest that went away. My sleep went up to four hours a night when it was like 20 minutes. Cause my body was so screwed up. Like all these symptoms, like overnight, I was like, Oh my God, this is crazy. You know, I, yeah. I saw it so profoundly. Um, but, I, and I wasn't even eating that bad before that, but so I, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of like a little bit more loose with it. I think everybody has to find what feels right for their body. Like I tried vegan for a little while. I did not feel good. Mm-mm. I was like, Nope, yeah. I gotta have, I gotta have meat. So I stick around like the paleo primal side of things and I try to avoid mm-hmm. sugar and carbs and all that. And that's when I feel my best. So right. it, was, it was super integral in my, in my healing. Yes. Yeah. So what you're saying is like, it, it plays a big role, right? The whole nutrition piece, the fitness piece, the sleep piece, like how much of what we experience and how much of what, I mean, I walk by people every single day, like when I go to public places, and I see sadness, I see aggravation, I see irritation. I'm like, how much of that is due to just being toxic? How much of that is due to poor sleep patterns? How much of that is due to not knowing what a lot of us know that are in this, you know, ancestral kind of holistic health realm? Yeah. And um, and again, so as some take home advice for anyone watching, listening, like it's like cover the the low hanging fruit first, like you know, cover the, these foundations, or at least in addition to everything else that you're doing, and you'll be blown away at, at how much better your emotional state and, and mental state and things like that are. That's kind of sounds like what you're saying, right? Yeah, yeah. I think we don't. I I told you this before, but I want I want to ask you a question because this is really important. Um, I look at it like your sleep impacts your mood today. How much sunlight you get today is going to impact your sleep tomorrow. What you ate three days ago is impacting your gut microbiome today. Like everything is connected. Nothing occurs in a vacuum. So even if you do like one of those things, it's going to improve you. And then maybe you can add a second one later and how you move. Like me, I feel terrible right now because I haven't moved enough today. And after this, I'm going to go lift weights because I know I can feel it in my body. I'm that in tune, you know, but here's the question for you, Paul, because I see this all the time. Like, I feel so bad though. I can't do these things. Hmm. you feel know, bad about the fact that you can't do them no you just mean? you just feel so toxic and so sluggish and so tired like you're telling me to change my diet and fix my sleep and go to the gym tomorrow that ain't happening right so like, yeah so I, I people when they you know i completely agree with you so like when i when i work with people in coaching it it's about it's not about going from zero to 100 right it's not about saying here's where you're at and this is everything that you need to do and you need to start tomorrow it's about like okay here's where you're at what is it that you want to see change? What is, what is something small, um, slightly challenging, but doable that I can implement that I think is going to move the needle in the direction of the direction I want to go. And then, like you said, small changes lead to big results. Sometimes, you know, a small change, like you feel just a little bit better than that. Good feeling is addictive. And then you add to it and then you add to it. You know, it doesn't have to be like a full blown perfectionist mindset. I'm just going to go out the gate and do everything. And if I can't, then forget it. It's like, what can you do? And, and that's where sometimes it helps to have like a coach or someone kind of pull you through that process. But I think your, your men- mentality around it's perfect. You know, it's like, you know, I can't, I can't do everything. So what can I, what is something small I can do? You know? Yeah, and the other thing I always find is like, people are always like, well, I need to be motivated. I need motivation. And it's like, not, it's not about motivation. It's like, it's a commitment. Like when I go to the grocery store, I commit to not buying sugar. 
and I might pick it up and I might walk around with it and then I go put it back. You know what I mean? Or yeah. like, I don't, I don't always want to go to the gym and I'm like, it ain't a choice. You have to. Yeah. Well, your, your motivation is your motivation is how you hope to feel. Right. And like you said, I, I used to have this, I used to call it using tomorrow for today. Like I want to feel good tomorrow. So therefore I'm going to do this thing today or these things today so that I can wake up and feel good tomorrow. And when I feel good tomorrow, then that means that today I'm going to do these things so I can feel good the next day. You know? So I, I, I loved it when you said that. Yeah. Um, so again, we're, we're talking about, okay, things that we can do, everyone can do. Um, uh, and I love uh, tying in the whole health piece. You, I think you had talked about like the healing mindset and also the symptom piece. Can you speak to that part of it? Like, is, are those interrelated or, or is that two separate things? Yeah, I think- Like listening like, to your body symptoms? Yeah, so symptoms for me is like, when I feel a little anxiety or I feel a little sad, I'm like, what, what needs attending to, or like, what is going on? So to me, it's like the, my body's way of communicating with me. There is no other way. Yeah. So instead of medicating it away or chasing it away or running, I can run away from it for a few days. You know, I can still do that, but eventually it's there and I can't ignore it. So it's like, okay, what do you like right now? I'm, I'm just going to be vulnerable and share with my, with you myself. I've been working way too much. I'm feeling kind of drained, I know. tired. I know. And so, and I've told you this, Paul, so it's like, I need to take a few days off work to reset, to literally do nothing. I just need to lay on my bed and scroll on Facebook or listen to a meditation, or I need to go get some groceries today and eat well and nourish myself for a few days. I can feel it. I can't go very long ignoring that stuff. Like I just can't, yeah. I'm trained to pay attention to it. And then what was your other question? Well, I mean, basically what we're saying here is because I know that you're big on symptoms and, and I am as well, right? It's like, you know, when your body's when you're feeling or experiencing something and, and this could be physiological, it could be mental and emotional because I think those two kind of feed into each other a lot, right? Yes. When you're experiencing these symptoms, this is your body. This is your body's way of trying to communicate something to you. Like something is off and honor that, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I think the medical system teaches us to go to a doctor for that. And I'm not telling right. you not to, you should, but you should also be like, what in my life is out of balance and look at it everywhere, spiritually, financially, emotionally, human connection, food, you know, everything, every, you know, you're you, this, we said this before, mental health is health. Like your health is your life. Like everything comes from that. So if you're living out of balance, your body's telling you that in one way or another, I don't, yeah. I can't, you know, but you have to learn that for yourself. Like, what is my body saying to me? And how do I listen to that? And what do I need to feel better? Like, I think that's what life is about. Like, I want to be my best self. I want to show up for my friends. I want to feel life fully. I want to be able to hike when I'm 50. You know, I want to be able to swim in a lake that's a little bit chilly. Um, I want to be able to jog. I want to walk my dog. I want to play with my nieces and nephews. Like, these are my, I want to live as fully as human being as possible, including my feelings. Like when I, my dog died, he was my service dog. And he was one of the reasons I got off all the meds and I went back to school because I was able, because he helped be that bridge between meds and no meds, you know? And uh, when he died, I was like, this is why people take antidepressants. It was the hardest. I was like, it's just a dog. It's not a spouse. I don't understand why I'm so affected, but mm -hmm. I, it, it like devastated me. And especially the way it happened, you know, it was kind of traumatic. And I just took the time and kind of like you, I played sad songs and I felt the grief come up. And I was like, here it is, just feel it and let it dissipate. You know, what can I do to honor him? And just what can I do to take care of myself? You know, uh, and then it, the pain slowly fades, you know, but um, I don't know. I just think our symptoms are telling us something and we have to listen yep. and medicate them away. Yeah. Physical symptoms and even the mental and emotional, you know, it's Everything. telling you something about something. Maybe you, you need to change something in your life, change your relationships, uh, you know, what it is that you're doing. You know, I mean, it's just you know, just really just paying attention to these things that your body's trying to tell you and your, and your uh, mind and emotions. And of course, ideally, that's in the context of doing a bunch of these different things that are good for your health in general, because sometimes I just feel like if you're if you're just if you don't have the health foundation, you know, a lot of it could be because of <laughs> you're not healthy, like you're just kind of toxic and you're experiencing these symptoms that you otherwise might not experience. Um, so what about um, when to seek professional help? Do you have any um, guidelines yeah, on I that? Think, and I think you just seek it with a, um, what's the word? Like informed in an informed way. So yeah, know yeah. that, you know, all these, there's healing professionals all over the place, acupuncture, chiropractic, 
it comes in many forms. Even a pastor at a church could be, you know, help a chaplain, um, a life coach, a health coach, whatever, just like you're, you're going for accountability. You're going for like new ideas on things to try, but don't hand your power over to someone else to do it for you. That is not how it works. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. So be, be an educated consumer, about. you know, like a, a big takeaway I'm hearing from you ever since I've been talking to you. It's like, you know, you, it's, it's great to seek help and, and try different modalities, but don't go into it blindly trusting anything. Right. No. And like, even, even clients that I have now, because we've been harmed by medications, it made our nervous system very sensitive to anything. So now it's like, you learn the hard way. Like I can't just take for granted uh, a jar of soup off the shelf without looking at the ingredients. You know what I mean? I can't take a supplement from a chiropractor without Googling it to make sure my nervous system can handle that because I have this injury from no. the GABA system in my nervous system. It doesn't work very well and I don't want to hurt myself. So like, I mean, I don't even drink tap water. Like that's how extreme I have gone because I know what's in there and I use a Berkey water filter, but you know, like just be informed about everything coming in your body, everything close to you. Like I don't use fabric softener. You know, I use certain, you know, chemicals and, you know, I, I am very careful with everything I do. And I think we should all be like that. I mean, it's just, you want to live consciously or not, you know, do you want to pay now or pay later? Yeah. So seek professional help yeah. when you feel like you want to, but just make sure that you're doing it like an educated yeah. consumer, just like you would be if you're like, like you said, reading labels and ingredients on, on packaging and, and just try to have conversations, try to figure out and understand these things, you know? Um, what about, do you have any advice for uh, people that, you know, want to come off of medications? Is that anything that we can talk about? Like, yeah, I would say, there's a lot of um, really good consumer information out there right now. It, it, and believe it or not, it's been generated by the people who have done it, not from the medical professionals. There's some research out there I could point to, you know, uh, Mark Horowitz on Twitter, if you want to go follow yeah. him. He's got lots yeah, I've, got, of, I've got a list of things he gave me and then I'll, I'll right. make okay. notes on everything so and share that. So go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So he'll put that sure. out. But basically the medical system has abandoned us as far as de-prescribing of psychiatric drugs. So you should do so very carefully with the advice of the resources he'll share, but I'll just name them because the people that are watching surviving mm -hmm. into the presence dot yep. org is one the withdrawal project and mm -hmm. intercompass initiative that's two i would In, those are intercompass ones. right i n n e r inter, intercompass yes. initiative. Inter initiative yep that one was reviewed by a pharmacist um the surviving antidepressants is an online forum with hundreds of thousands of people that have come i'm sorry i'm exaggerating probably like I think there's like 50,000 case studies or something where people showed how they came off drugs. They talk about their symptoms, how they healed. And you can see how, you know, we have general guidelines for how do you taper off of a drug that's a tablet or a capsule? How slowly do you need to go? You know, these are all things that should be thought through. So there's a lot of research. It's not something to be done overnight. Never. And don't ever, ever, ever cold turkey a drug. Never, never, never unless it's like yeah. a life threat situation. So, and again, there's also harm reduction. You don't have to come off of all of them. Perhaps you want to get pregnant or you want to breastfeed after your pregnancy or you're getting to be up. I, I have a lot of women and it makes me so sad. Like a lot of women in their middle age where they went on an antidepressant in their twenties because like they had a breakup in college or something and they, their doctor left them on and didn't say a word and they didn't think anything about that. And now they're in their fifties and they're like, why am I still on Lexapro? This doesn't even make yeah. sense. Yeah. That's think scary. about that. You get that, you get, you get prescribed something and then you move <laughs> and you, and you just, yeah. like, oh, just taking well, this thing. Yeah, or your it. doctor retires or like a lot of with the benzo situation, a lot of people on the pandemic were put on benzos for anxiety. And now they're like, I need to come off of this. What's going on. And now they didn't know they were going to go through withdrawal. They didn't know yeah. that. So now they have yeah. to figure out how to get off the benzo or, you know, their doctor retires or when you hit a certain age, your doctor will take you off medications that are, uh, like benzos because they don't want people in their 60s or 70s on those drugs so it's to me it's just a matter of time do you want to take control of your health now or do you want to wait for that to happen to you where mm -hmm. your doctor doesn't understand withdrawal and they cold turkey you off something you don't want that to happen you yeah. know so there's lots of reasons people come off but anyway do so with an informed manner from those resources that me and you are going to share yeah don't tons really of resources but then also uh apcotconsulting.com right oh, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what you do I'm full right now right? but i'm so full but my website has a bunch of resources on it too angiepeacock.com if you need the you'd resources. be the first person i want to go to but um i know but, I, I have to, come off successfully and yeah, yeah others but to clarify you're not you're you don't encourage anyone to do anything but if they make the decision to do it then yeah, you not, can help coach them through the process i am it, not you know here I mean? to convince yeah. you 
No. And yeah. I never want to be, that's a danger area for me. Like if you believe in your medicine and it's helping you, that's fine. I don't, I'm not the one for you. I'm the one for people that have made the decision. They know the drug is affecting them. They don't want to take it. They have informed themselves. They're on their own taper plan. They already figured yeah. that part out and I'm just supporting yeah. you on your way down. That's kind cool. of correct. Okay. So Peyton asks, if, if you don't mind, um, what is the best thing to do when something happens and you need to settle down? Like, is there any strategy for in the moment? I just got hit with something and I'm freaking funked out. You know, I, I would say, what? I don't have the answer to that. You have the answer to it. And you got it. No, oh, I mean, the person. whoever, okay, whoever yeah, it's yeah. happening to. Yeah. It's like, yeah. the way I tell my clients is you have to study your symptoms and you have to figure out what's going to work and you're going to have to try lots of stuff. And some stuff works for a little while and sometimes doesn't work at all. Like I have people that try get a meditation and they're like, Oh, this is wonderful. It changed my whole life. And then other people mm -hmm. are like, I cannot stand people talking to me. It doesn't work for me, yeah. but acupuncture does. But I, I, what I think is when something hard happens, seek human connection first. That's yeah. always my first thing. Like find someone you can talk to that can handle it, whether that's a therapist or a preacher or a friend or a yoga teacher, like someone in your life that, doesn't, that doesn't try to fix it, a friend, whatever. I know a lot of us are lonely, so we don't have a lot of friends sometimes, which is hor horrible, but, um, you know, somebody that's not going to try to fix it or minimize what you're feeling or gaslight you or tell you, get, pull up your bootstraps, you know, just, you need a hard place to fall when hard things happen. You really do. Yeah. Someone yeah. that lets you cry, that kind of stuff. So see human yeah. connection. Yeah. And, and if you don't mind, God, just throw my two cents in on that too. Um, yeah. I would say, you know, when you get hit with things, like one of the best things for me has been just sticking to my health routine, period. Right. Just sticking to the things that I know make me feel good. And, uh, you know, it's, again, it's not that I'm not going to experience whatever it is that I'm going through, but as I move through it, committed to these different health habits, it just helps you move through it, you know? So, mm -hmm. um, but, and then if I hear you right, also, Angie, you're saying in the moment, even though everyone's different, you can consider things like, you know, uh, some breathing exercises, you know, going for a walk, you know, journaling, doing a workout, talking to a friend, journaling, nature, go for a yeah, walk. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I think a lot of people say like, it's not that easy. My symptoms are so severe and I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying there's like a one size fits all. If you do some yoga and some exercise, you're going to be fine. No, this stuff is hard and it takes months. It's not, yeah. we're, we're conditioned to believe you take a pill and it's gone. That's not how healing happens. That's not how health, you know, it's not like an overnight thing. It's not, you don't just get rid of grief overnight either. It takes months. You know, it's yeah. very long. Healing for real is like a long, hard process. You got to try lots of stuff and figure out what works. Yeah. And, and well, and I think you take, um, a little something, you take a little something, I get it, you know, to like help buffer that even CBD oil or like you drink wine at night. I know that sounds controversial, but like some people do that, but they're like yeah. working on healing during the day, you know? I well, and like we mentioned before, I think sometimes, um, again, back to the question, like, what do you do when you get hit with something, right? Um, sometimes it's useful to just be with it, just feel it. Like, it's fascinating sometimes, like some of the pain and the heartache and, and whatever that is that you're feeling, if, you're have, if you have the awareness to be there with it and feel it. And again, it doesn't make it better, doesn't necessarily make it go away, but there's just something about that presence that I, I personally, I feel like that is, it, it's just... You, you develop some kind of a wisdom and strength coming out of that versus distracting yourself, numbing yourself and not saying, don't do those things. Maybe those can be useful. I don't know. You know, I'm just saying sometimes the solution is there's not a solution except just to be there with it I and just to feel it, you know? Absolutely agree with you. I totally. And even, even, you know, that, you know what I'm going through personally. So mm -hmm. I've, I've laid with my pain for quite a few days and I play music. And I am really emotional and I'm like, what is this about? This isn't even about the situation. This is about me and my own wounds and my mm. inadequacy and my insecurities. And so if something happens, it's not just this, I'm not a victim of it. You know, I have a friend that tells me like, Angie, everything is happening for you. And when I look at it through that lens, like, okay, mm. you know, this happened for me to grow from, or this yeah. happened for me to get in touch with myself again, or this happened for me to know to re, you know, reprioritize my, the needs and the wants in my life or, you know, what makes me feel good. Again, it's a reminder, you know, so I just look at it differently. Like you said, you're going into it. I'm not running away from it anymore. Yeah. You feel yeah. it. And you can have those kind of conversations with yourself. Like, you know, like three years from now, I'm going to look back on this and I'll be, 
a better person, a different person. I'm going to learn something from this. You know, there's, uh, you know, like you having those kind of conversations with yourself, I think can be useful. Untethered soul, right, Sarah? Like freaking like just being with the thing, right? Um, all right, cool. So what's that? I, I also just wanted to say thank you so yes. much for um, having your strength and your courage for sharing your story. Thank you for your service, both on the military side and the civilian side and just being such an advocate for health and wellness and your passion is just it's incredible it's exuding out so thank you thank you sarah thank you so yeah. much thank you i second that angie after going through all that stuff um what could you share with us what if you could if you could go back and talk to yourself talk to that version of yourself um, before start embarking on uh, the medical treatment system, like what would you say to that version of yourself? Um, I would say that everything I was experiencing was normal for what happened to me in that context and that there's no easy answer to it. There's no pill to take or doctor that's going to fix it or anybody that's going to take it away, that you're going to have to take some time off to sit and think about what happened, to grieve, to cry, to talk to your friends, to hang on tight, but things are going to be okay. There's a natural healing process that needs to happen. That's what I would do in hindsight. Okay, cool. Cause that was going to be my next question. You know, like what would you have actually done? So the conversation with your, with that version of yourself would have been, Hey, experience this. And yeah. as hard as it is, it's normal for the, the amount of trauma that you went through, you yeah. know, and then, and then seeking out all the different resources and support that you needed as you went through that. Right. Yeah. Basically, the message is be with it, be with whatever you're feeling like. Don't run away or look for an easy fix because there isn't any that doesn't exist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I thought that was just so powerful. You know, uh, it, it mirrors a lot of what we experience um, going through the medical health system. Right. About the whole symptoms, diagnosis, you know, uh, prescribed medication thing. And we're not saying that um, not to seek professional help and that the, those things might not be useful in some situations, but you need to be an informed consumer. And um, and a lot of these life situations that we go through, again, not to minimize them like that. I mean, they're they're traumatic like they are, but they are they they are what they are. And um, and we have to deal with them regardless and um, however you need to do that, whether it's seeking professional help or, or counselors or friends and family members or something like that, um, do what you got to do. But just understand there's nothing wrong with you when you experience grief and sadness and anxiety and depression and, and these other things. You know, it's just um, they're things that we have to work with and deal with. And pro tip, you got to freaking get your nutrition and your sleep and your fitness and all this stuff figured out. Because when you have that foundation, I've seen miracles happen in my, I'm telling you, like some of my clients, they come in first session and then two weeks, four weeks later, they're completely, their attitude is completely different. Not that it was bad in the beginning, but they're just happy. Go, you know, it's just something shifts when you get that foundation fixed. So if, if you're watching or listening to this and and you feel like, you know, things just aren't going your way or you're just in a funk and you're constantly in a funk, like that's one really good place to start. But um i don't know thank you so much angie i think that was just um amazing and beautiful and, and um, thank you for sharing your story and i just think you're an amazing person i really do oh, thanks paul the feeling is mutual